The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. A-H-O. A-H-O. If you contemplate placing a mortgage on your home, it will pay you to remember those letters. They stand for the Assured Home Ownership Plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. A money-saving, home-saving plan designed to speed the day when you can say, No mortgage on my house. I own it free and clear. If that appeals to you, please listen carefully in about 13 minutes for full information on the Equitable A-H-O Plan. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Armed Robbery. It's titled, The Innocent Santa Claus. Nearly all criminals are emotionally childish, undependable, and unscrupulous. Some, like the characters you'll meet in tonight's dramatization from FBI files, are more vicious than others. But make no mistake about it. The dashing and charming Robin Hood types are few and far between. Criminals taint with unhappiness the lives of all those with whom they come in contact. The little niceties of life, the decent, courteous kindnesses, the Christmas spirit itself, that make up normal people's lives are completely foreign to the vast majority of them. Whatever they do is for themselves alone. One of your FBI's major purposes in bringing you these programs is to present the underworld as it really is, without glamour, without sentimentality. Tonight's FBI file opens in a cheap hotel room in the downtown district of a large eastern city. A 12-year-old girl is alone in the room. She walks to a full-length mirror on the wall and sings a song. When she finishes, she bows to the mirror. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind applause. That was a great act, but we've got a long show. So let's meet a star who needs no introduction. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't hear you come in. Honey, you ought to know better than to try to bring on a star that way. Oh, but I was just trying to have a... what theater were you playing? The one I'm named after. All right. You're on the stage at the Roxy. A sensational flash act has just finished. Mm -hmm. Now your star is on next. So you want to give her a bill, huh? But, Daddy, you always say, and now a star who needs no introduction. I know I do. But then I introduce them. Oh. And I tell a couple of jokes. Like, as I was coming in the stage door tonight, a bum came up and asked me for $2 for a cup of coffee. And I said, $2 for a cup of coffee? Why, you can get one for a nickel. And he shrugged his shoulder and says, (laughs) Well, can I help it if I'm a big tipper? (laughs) Now you got the audience going, see? So you slug him again. Mm -hmm. You say, that bum is sure crazy. I met him yesterday, too, and he asked me for $8 for a piece of pie. And I said, $8 for a piece of pie? Well, man, you can get one for a dime. And he shrugged and says, Mister, do I tell you where to eat? (laughs) Now they're warmed up, see? And you bring on your star. You get it? Oh, yes. Oh, say, anybody call me? Oh, Pete Morrow. Pete Morrow, what do you want? I don't know. I got the message at the desk. Hey, maybe he's got some action. Gee, Daddy, you think so? Well, he's my agent, Eddie. He wouldn't call to find out how I was. Hey, maybe they need some next-to-closing insurance at the palace. Can be anything. Wow, we. Well, come on. Hit me with a good luck kiss, and I'll go see him. Hey, Pete. Say, sorry to keep you waiting. Yeah, oh, oh, hello, Fred. I just got your message, and let me tell you, brother, I am ready. I got two new routines, and I got a kid writing me a parody on Melancholy Baby. Ho, oh, oh. ho, wait till give you the opening. I come out in a broken-down suit, see? Hey, hey, Fred, Fred, I didn't call you for a theater job. Oh, well, that's okay. I do just as good in nightclubs. I'll just move the song up. Wait a minute, Fred. This ain't a nightclub job either. 
A guy uptown called me this morning, and he's having a Christmas party for some kids at his house tonight. He wants a guy to play Santa Claus. And you call me for that? That's it. Now, look, Pete. I know Vaudeville's dead, but there's still a lot of places where I can... Make... There's 25 bucks in it. Well, look, I give my dresser more than that. Fred, look, I better level with you. Vaudeville ain't dead, but you are. I couldn't book you in a charity bazaar. You couldn't book Abraham Lincoln at a patriotic rally. You want the job or not? No. Okay, then I'll get somebody else. Well, go ahead. Oh, Fred. By the way, how's your kid these days? Great. Good. I'm glad to hear it. She eating good? Well, sure. I got to cut her down. <laughs> she's getting a little heavy. Well, she's even... Yeah? Even what? Okay. I'll do it. Your Santa Claus outfit's right there in that box. A car will pick you up in front of your hotel at 7. Now you'll be ready. Daddy, how'd you make wait, out? Wait, wait, wait till I get rid of this box. <laughs> oh. Now I'll take that hug. Oh, mm. Daddy, what happened? Well... Pete Mara told me Oscar Hammerstein says he positively can't do his next show without me. And so that put Pete in the spot. Why? Well, Max Gordon's got a script. And he told Pete if I don't do it, he'll never hire another actor from him. And... Oh, the spaghetti! Oh. Ow! Oh. Did you burn yourself? I'm sorry. I didn't keep watching and the water all boiled out and the spaghetti's ruined. Uh, so what? That was our last can. Look... You're going down to the grill and eat steak. But they said at the desk, no more signing. I'm paying them cash. Now, go ahead. Go ahead. Aren't you eating with me? Uh, no, honey. Where are you going? Well, you see, Oscar Hammerstein is crazy to have me in the show he's doing, but the angels don't know me. So Oscar asked me if I'd do him a favor and audition. Oh. Well, you never saw a guy so sorry in your life asking me to audition. But I told him I don't mind. I knew the spot he's in. Can I go? Oh, no, no, no. Not tonight, honey. Now hit me with a good luck kiss and run down and have your dinner. That's it. Now, go ahead. But, Daddy, I always thought when they did a show, they hired the actors before they bought the costumes. Well, they do. Then how come Mr. Hammerstein had your costume already? Huh? On that box, it says Santa Claus costume, size 42. Oh, that. <laughs> uh, well, you see, after the audition, I'm going to play a benefit. Daddy... Okay. I never could con you. You want to know what a big star your old man is? I'm playing Santa Claus at a kid's party uptown. You're playing Santa Claus? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Hmm? Daddy, that's great. Santa Claus is the biggest star in town right now. Who's bigger? Well, to... Hope, Crosby, the Lone Ranger, they're nothing at Christmas time. Santa Claus and his reindeer are headliners. Uh, maybe you're right. Of course I am. It's perfect casting. They finally got a star playing a star's part. Don't you understand? Yeah, I understand. Thanks, honey. You Fred Harper? Yeah. All right, get in. Okay. <clears throat> hey, who's throwing this party? Mr. Caldwell. You his chauffeur? Uh-huh. See, look, uh, I never worked a thing like this before. You mind if I try a couple of gags on you? Go ahead. Well, I figure I'll walk out and say... I know Santa Claus is supposed to come in through the door, but them chimney sweeps have got a real strong union. <laughs> Nothing, huh? Yeah, maybe it's a little too fast. How about this? I'd have been here sooner except for one of my reindeer. He showed up late because he went to the movies. It seems he wanted to see the picture because he read the book. <laughs> Say, pal, was your mother frightened by Ned Sparks? You know, it ain't against the law to laugh in this city. Uh-huh. What are we doing down here by the river? You, uh, see that sign? Which one? Don't! The 
following day on a street corner near the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor meets Police Detective Mike Wolf. Hey, Mike. Oh, hello, Jim. I just coming up to see you. Oh, what about? A jewel theft last night. Where? Uptown. The home of some people named Caldwell. Huh? What's our jurisdiction? Interstate transportation. Uh huh? These Caldwells live in a big house on the heights just off the approach to the Huntington Bridge. You know where the cloverleaf turn begins. Yo. Well, they were having a Christmas party last night for their children and some neighborhood kids. Mr. Caldwell went all out and hired an actor to play Santa Claus. Santa Claus stuck up the place. Oh, no. Yeah. Tied up the children, the Caldwells, and their help, and then he emptied Mrs. Caldwell's jewel case. Hold it. Hold it, Mike. Yeah. The light's against it. How much did Santa grab at the party? About $15,000 worth of jewelry and three hundred dollars in cash. Oh, that's quite a haul. After he left, one of the parents wiggled over to a window and saw him drive across the bridge. How'd they know it was a thief's car? Oh, it had a broken taillight, so they could follow it all the way. Ah. Uh-huh. The alarm's already gone out on the car. Mark, go on. Mike, any prints found around the place? I haven't been up there yet, but I doubt we'll come across any. Part of the Santa Claus outfit was a pair of rubber gloves. Oh, I see. Well, we won't need the prints for identification, though. We know who Santa Claus was. How? Mr. Caldwell told me he was hired through a theatrical agent named Pete Morrow. I contacted Morrow and learned that he sent an actor named Fred Harper. Uh-huh. Find out where he lives? Yeah, at the hotel vending. I called there, but his room didn't answer. You interviewed the uh, victim ship? No, I was going to do that now. Okay. I'll go over to Harper's hotel. What do you want, Mac? Hello there. I'm Special Agent Taylor of the FBI. Here are my credentials. What can I do for you? Will you please ring Mr. Fred Harper's room? He's not in. His little girl's been looking for him, too. Seems he didn't get home last night. Oh, you know Harper? Very well. I was once his straight man. Is he in trouble? Yes, he seems to be. Mr. Perry, have you heard from my daddy yet? No, I haven't, Roxy. Mr. Taylor, this is Harper's daughter, Roxy. Mr. Taylor's from the FBI. Hello there. Do you know where my daddy is? Well, no, I don't. Can you help me find him? I mean, please. Well, we'll do our best, Roxy. Did you uh, see your father last night? Yes, sir. He was going to play a party as Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. Were you here when he left? Yes. A man called for him. You see this man? Only from the window. He was in a big car. Daddy got in and went with him. Mm-hmm. What kind of a car was it? I don't know. Or was it a sedan, a convertible? A sedan. Uh, What color? I couldn't tell. But I do remember one thing. One of the lights in back was broken. Oh? Mr. Taylor, why are you asking me all these questions? Well, Roxy, somebody came to that party wearing a Santa Claus outfit and held up the people. A a real hold-up? With a gun? That's right. Not Daddy. He couldn't do anything like that. He's not a crook. Mr. Taylor... Phone call for you. Oh, thanks. Please believe me, Mr. Taylor. I'll be right back, Roxy. You can take it on that phone. Fine, thanks. Hello. Hey, Jim. This is Mike Wolf. Yeah, Mike. Fred Harper's been picked up. Oh, where? Near the approach to the Huntington Bridge. And two of the stolen pieces of jewelry were found in his pocket. We will return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official file, which shows how your FBI helps promote America's security. And now, listen to the most important security letters in the lives of thousands of homeowners. A-H-O. A is for assured. H is for home. O is for ownership. The assured home ownership plan of the Equitable Society. It's America's finest plan of home ownership because it gives four special benefits not always found in other mortgage plans. First benefit, an equitable AHO plan gives you a way to pay off your mortgage years ahead of time. That's right. One of the big objectives of this equitable society plan is to speed the day when you can proudly say... No mortgage on our house. We own it. Free and clear. Here's why this can happen so fast. Every equitable AHO plan combines a low-cost first mortgage with life insurance protection. One monthly payment takes care of both. Thanks to the insurance element, a constantly growing cash loan fund is created. Year by year, the mortgage grows smaller and the cash loan fund larger, 
until it actually is big enough to pay off what's left of the mortgage. This explains how hundreds of AHO families pay off their 20-year mortgages in about 14 years. That's six years ahead of schedule. Second benefit of an equitable assured home ownership plan. If the owner dies, his widow doesn't inherit a mortgage. She inherits the home, free and clear. And what's more, the Equitable Society not only cancels the mortgage, but also returns to the widow every cent her husband had paid to reduce the principal. Lastly, this plan is a money saver at all times. The mortgage draws interest at only 4%. So for many reasons, a man may consider himself lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home enable him to qualify for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. For full information, see your Equitable Society representative or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Remember, the sooner you start an Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, the sooner you'll be able to say, No mortgage on our home. We own it. Free and clear. And now back to the FBI file, The Innocent Santa Claus. We referred previously to the selfishness and callousness of the criminal mind. During the Christmas season, when the vast majority of us are in a genial, relaxed mood, the underworld does not hesitate even at this season to strike often and hard. There's no off-season in crime. Being off guard is not safe at any time. The men of your FBI are convinced that it is high time to stop romanticizing gangsters and hoodlums. FBI agents who come in contact with the underworld daily know it for what it is. Ruthless around the calendar, with no days off for good behavior. Tonight's FBI file continues in the hospital ward at the city jail. Special Agent Jim Taylor is interviewing Fred Harper. Mr. Harper, you insist that Mr. Caldwell's chauffeur knocked you out last night? Don't these lumps on my noggin prove it? But Mr. Caldwell says he has no chauffeur and never sent a car for you. Well, whoever the guy was, he belted me out. And that's all you can tell me. Mr. Taylor, do I look like a guy who'd stick up a kid's party? Well, unfortunately, looks don't mean a thing. <laughs> but I've never been picked up even for jaywalking. The only record I got is in the back issues of Variety. Are you sure you can't remember anything about this man? Well, he's a tough audience. What do you mean? I told him two jokes. Both boffs. He never even cracked a smile. Look, my agent can prove they sent a car for me. Pete Morrow in the central building. Yes, I know. Detective Wolf spoke to him. He claims he gave you the Santa Claus outfit and Caldwell's address, and you were supposed to get there by yourself. Well, he's a liar. Well, his word is better than yours right now. Why? He didn't turn up with any of the stolen jewelry on him. But I'm being framed. No, you're not. <coughs> this case won't be closed till we find the rest of that jewelry. Al. Albert, don't hold out on me. I ain't. Is this all the stuff you grabbed last night? Except for the two hunks I stuck in Harper's pocket. Well, the papers made it a much bigger job. Oh, the papers, the papers. They got Illinois as a seven-point favorite in a Rose Bowl. Can you bet them? <laughs> Not me, no. Well, the same with stick-ups. I once heisted a joint, got 200 clams. Papers come out and say I grabbed 8,000. This is the age we live in, kid. Now, uh... You're going to get the fence this, huh? Well, I'm not going to tell you that. Well, why not? Well, because the next time we do a job, you might take the loot straight to him. Well, I wouldn't do that. Well, let's leave it this way. You don't mind, do you? I suppose I do. Well, it won't make any difference. All right, then I don't mind. Fine. You call me tomorrow, and I'll tell you how much we're cutting up. Honey. I got so scared last night when you didn't come home. Well, keep being scared. We're still in a jackpot. Mr. Taylor told me he was coming to see you. Didn't you tell him you had nothing to do with it? Mm-hmm. But I'm still here. Oh, they'll let you go. Oh, sure. 
When they take this turban off my noggin, they'll move me down to a regular cell downstairs. Great guy you got for an old man. I know you didn't steal anything. Thanks, honey. Oh, oh hand me that bottle of pills. My head starts coming off if I get up. Here. And a little water, honey. Thanks. What kind of pills are those? I don't know. Well, here goes. Oh, they taste like chopped up theater tickets. Nothing, huh? I just don't feel like laughing. Daddy, will you be out Friday? I doubt it. Why? I promised my teacher. <coughs> promised her what? Well, the school Christmas play is Friday. I told her you'd be there. Well, that's fine. But I'm such a hit here, I think they'll hold me over. But I told my teacher what a sensational Santa Claus you do. Daddy, we've got to figure some way to get you out by Friday. Well, if you get an idea, cut me in for half. Isn't there anything we can do? Sure. Just keep hoping, honey. Mike, I got a report from our lab on that jewelry. No, oh, what's the word, Jim? They found a single latent fingerprint on one of the bracelets. Mm, we've got Fred Harper's prints right here. Oh, yeah, I've already checked. It's not one of his. Well, that doesn't prove he's innocent. I can't help feeling he is, though. You believe the story about the mysterious stranger posing as Caldwell Chauffeur? Yeah, yeah, I do. Harper's little girl told me about the taillight on that car being broken. There's no way she could have known that if she wasn't telling the truth. Yeah, pardon me. Sure, Mike. Wolf speaking. This is Captain Gordon, State Police. We've got that car you set out the alarm on. Where? One of my men just found it where Highway 81 hits the turnpike. I'll see that nobody touches it. Thanks, Captain. Come on, Jim. Car's been found. Yeah, that's the car, all right, Mike. Mm hmm. There's the broken tail lane. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's see what's inside it. Mike, look here on the back seat. Huh? Santa Claus outfit. There's a pants, shirt. Hood, there's a whiskers on the floor. Mm -hmm. Any labels? Yeah, I'll take a look. Yeah. Yale Costume Company, but that's no help. Harper's agent admits running this suit. Mm. Well, suppose we go through the trunk. Oh, wait a minute. I'll look up front first, Mike. Right. Police went over everything in the car for prints. It was clean. Yeah, let's take a look in here. Well, these glove compartments are like the clocks. They never work. Ah, there's... Road maps, instruction books, baseball scorecard. Mike, rubber gloves. Let's head back to town and get these to the lab. Hello, Pete. Well, Fred, how come they let you out? Uh, Mr. Taylor here can tell you. Who, Taylor? Yes, I'm a special agent of the FBI. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if I may. Sure, 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 anything. Sit down, sit down. Thanks. Now, Mr. Morrow, you told Detective Wolf you made no arrangements to have Harper picked up the other night. Yeah, that's right. We found that car yesterday. The one he used in the stick-up? Well, the one that was used, but not by Harper. We also found the gloves that were part of the hold-up man's costume. Oh, so? So our laboratory got a full set of prints off the inside of those gloves. One of them matches a print we got from a piece of jewelry we found in Harper's pocket. Well, uh, what's that all got to do with me? Well, the prints belong to somebody named Al Bedford. Huh? Who? Uh, Mr. Taylor, I told you what to expect. This guy wouldn't give you the right time in Elgin, Illinois. Mr. Morrow, you know Al Bedford. Well, uh, is he an actor? He's a professional criminal. Well, then how would I know him? His record shows you once gave him a character reference when he put in for a parole. What's his name? Uh, Al what? Al Bedford. You better be nice to him, Pete. Maybe he'll give you the job booking talent on those prison shows. Say, I don't know what either one of you guys are talking yeah. about. Oh, hi, Mike. We caught Al Bedford. I just got a full confession from him. Mr. Morrow here was his partner. Ah, that's a lie. Hey, Mr. Taylor. 
That clears me now, huh? Yes, it does. Then I'd better call my kid and find out if there's still time to do that Santa Claus bit. All right. Mike here can drop Murrow off at the city jail. I'll go with you. The auditorium's down this way, Mr. Taylor. That's yeah, a pretty big school. Mm-hmm. Got the biggest stage of any school in town. That's why Roxy goes here. No. <laughs> I think she's majoring in proscenium arches. <laughs> what time you got? It's uh, 4.15. Hope we're not late. Hey, you want in on a secret? What? I'm scared. <laughs> scared of what? Walking out on that stage in front of 2,000 kids. Oh, you've been on plenty of stages. Yeah, but what do you do with Santa Claus? You can't get hokey. You got to play him straight. Oh, I guess this is a stage door. I saw four kids walk in here wearing halos. Oh, they started. Yo. Guess they got tired waiting. Hmm? Can't blame them. You see a little girl around there? No. Look. At what? The old man in the Santa Claus costume over there. Oh. Come on. Hey, where are you going? I've been canceled. Daddy! Honey. Daddy, Daddy! Honey. You made it, Daddy, you made it. Yeah, look, honey, Mr. Taylor and I are going out front now and catch the show. Out front? Well, we don't want to hang around backstage here and get in everybody's way. But you're Santa Claus. We can't do the show without you. Now, baby, don't let me down easy. There's Sam Whiskers sitting over there on that trunk. Oh, that's the janitor. He was standing in for you till you got here. Well, why don't you let him do it? He's got no Santa Claus material. Daddy, you promised me. Yeah, but suppose I lay an egg. You? <laughs> oh, Daddy, you're teasing me. Okay, I'll do it. I think I'll go out front to watch this. All right, and thanks again, Mr. Taylor. You're very welcome. And Merry Christmas. And the same to both of you. Oh, let's make it bigger. Let's make it Merry Christmas to everybody. And heaven and nature sing. And And now we bring you a message from the book of Luke in the New Testament. A message shared with you by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover every special agent and employee of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A message also shared with you by every officer and employee of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. A message which comes, too, from those who bring you this weekly program. A message written in simple words. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Anthony Barrett, Walter Catlett, J.C. Flippin, Tony Hughes, Bill Johnstone, and Ann Whitfield. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating wishing you a merry, merry Christmas from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time to This is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood.